good evening and good morning uh, wherever you are welcome to youth policy forums newest flagship series on evidence with uh, famida khatun i am famida khatun the host of this series and it is a pleasure to speak with you today this evening um as uh, you know that ypf or yeah, youth policy forum has been uh, doing a number of uh, episodes on various issues so this is a new uh, episode which is uh, about uh, discussion on evidence based uh, issues and uh, as you know that ypf has always promoted evidence informed decision making for the policy formulation of the country and to that end um, the forum has arranged many flagship series dialogues and projects including the talking policies many of you must have uh, watched that heard that and there's another uh, two other programs also road to reforms and governance apprenticeship apprenticeship so um YPF Governance Apprenticeship is one of our flagship programs, which is designed to create a platform to exchange of knowledge between the youth and the incumbent policy makers or policy advocates of the country. So, through this policy advocacy project, YPF has already worked closely with different policy makers and um, also in in. towards uh, various policy recommendations so in continuation of that vision the on evidence series of youth policy forum aims to bring evidence based discourse to the forefront and allow the audience to learn from and engage with policy makers and experts on different policy areas so the objective of this series is to create an ecosystem where uh, young people pioneer the use of the evidences in policy discussions um, and in today's launch episode we have chosen a very crucial and timely topic that is bangladesh's graduation from the least developed country st status as we know that um, in february this year bangladesh has uh, has um, uh, qualified to graduate from the ldc group uh, earlier in 2018 as you may remember many of you that uh, bangladesh had fulfilled all three criteria for ldc graduation we will discuss that and we are very happy and honored to have ambassador masood bin momin uh, foreign secretary uh, with the senior secretary of the government of bangladesh with us today and he um, has a vast knowledge and on the ground experience of bangladesh's ldc graduation process and we will discuss with him uh, on how to utilize the evidences as bangladesh prepares its ldc graduation strategy ypf senior fellow of entrepreneurship and future thinking mr samuel hawk has also joined and we also have been joined by mr nakibur rahman who is the uh, former managing director glaxo smith klein and current executive director of dbl group so we'll also hear from them apart from that two young researchers will be presenting the evidences and past lessons to set the initial direction of today's dialogue and present uh, some questions um, some from the youth in line with youth uh, agenda to encourage the fact based and informed dialogues among the citizens and also to to bridge the gap between citizens and policies because uh, the objective is is to have um, a policy which has the uh, the um, recommendations and the inputs from broader uh, stakeholders of the country so with that uh, vision in mind our first episode on policy Uh, on evidence um, and without further ado i think i will uh, invite uh, our young researchers um, to make a short presentation but before uh, you know going to that let me just also uh, just give a briefing on um, how we have structured the session so after the presentation by youth policy forums research team on the issue we will go to for the discussion uh, with the um, honorable secretary 
And uh, during that discussion, I'll also invite the senior fellows who have expertise on two very important areas. One is on the pharmace pharmaceutical uh, sector and the other one is on the technology. Uh, so with that, I would now um, invite Ms. Anuradha Bishas and Ms. Raida Moshed to make a brief presentation. I know this is a very vast topic, but you'll have to really I know, make it very fast. So over to you. Thank you, Miss. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Raida Moshed, and with me, I have Anuradha Bishash. And we will now make a short presentation on LDC graduation of Bangladesh. Oh, can we have a change in slide? Yeah. Uh, so our list of contents, we will start with a brief definition of LDCs. We will then move on to uh, what LDC graduation criteria are. Uh, we will talk a little bit about Bangladesh's LDC graduation, what opportunities we will have and what challenges we will face. We will also look at what previous LDC graduates did and what lessons we can get from them. And finally, we will have some policy recommendations. So beginning with LDC uh, definition, least developed countries or LDCs is a classification by the United Nations that categorizes countries based on certain economic and development indicators. LDCs are characterized typically by very vulnerable economies, greater susceptibility to poverty, lack of infrastructure, qualitative issues of education, and adverse reactions to external shocks, such as natural disasters. LDCs are entitled to certain benefits, which include preferential access to markets, ba uh, benefits based on LDC-specific fulfillments of the World Trade Organization, and commitments made by international committees to facilitate development of trade capacity and more. There are three criteria for graduating from LDC status. First, we have gross national income or GNI per capita, which has to be above US dollar 1,222. Human assets index or HAI has to be above 66. And economic vulnerability index or EVI has to be below 32. As we can see, Bangladesh has fulfilled all three of these criteria. We will now look at, into the opportunities and challenges that Bangladesh will have to face. Let us begin with the following internal strengths of Bangladesh. Bangladesh, Bangladesh has a strong youth-led economy and manufacturing hubs are emerging in garments, textiles, agro and food industry. We also have a good position in production capacities index scores compared to various LDC graduation countries. However, the following weaknesses persist. Firstly, there is a lack of good governance and training across all sectors to standardize them. There is no internal R&D and a major skill gap persists in various sectors, especially in the intellectual property rights area. There are, however, several opportunities to look forward to. Bangladesh will be able to increase its regional standard and international position. We will be able to create value-based trading relationships with innovation in mind. Another opportunity is that trading relationship will improve and enhance foreign direct investment in the private sector. On the other hand, the country would also be susceptible to the following threats. Bangladesh might lose lucrative benefits of LDC, such as duty-free, quota-free access to the export market for the most prominent sectors. Competition will increase and the cost of intellectual property rights and in and its implementation process is substantially high, and this will actually undermine the access to affordable medicines and other industrial products compared to neighboring countries. Let us now look into the lessons we can learn from the previous LDC graduates. For this presentation, we've made a comparative analysis of six countries, Botswana, which was the first to graduate in 1994, Cape Verde, Maldives, and Samoa, which graduated between 2007 and 2014, the most researched graduate, Equatorial Guinea, and also Vietnam. Though it is technically wasn't in an LDC in the first place, its economy is the most relevant compared to that of Bangladesh's. Bangladesh can take inspiration from the strategies of these countries 
followed uh, of these countries followed to ease their transition and the successive years that followed. Firstly, the alignment of ODA to national priorities was the case for Botswana, Cape Verde, Samoa. This would serve as a model for Bangladesh as it adjusts to ro lower reliance on aid following LDC graduation. Secondly, Bangladesh would prepare to follow bilateral and multilateral trade agreements and strengthen ties with international community like Cape Verde, Samoa, and Vietnam did. Thirdly, reduced external debt and maintaining a current account surplus would be a key strategy as followed by Botswana. Moreover, a common strategy implemented by Botswana, Cape Verde, Maldives, and Samoa was to invest in infrastructure and capi human capital, which would be highly important for Bangladesh in preparation for its economy post-graduation. Last but not the least, focusing on macroeconomic stability is vital something that Botswana, Cape Verde, Maldives, and Samoa stressed on. Now we will take a look at some of the biggest challenges that these countries still face. Firstly, we have lack of good governance. We have seen that Equatorial Guinea struggled with investing in infrastructure and human capital because of its lack of good governance and corruption. We, secondly, we have little economic diversification. We have seen that Botswana, Equatorial Guinea, and Vietnam are still heavily reliant on diamonds, oil, and the RMG sector, respectively. Thirdly, we have challenge with debt management. Samoa was classified as being at high risk of debt distress a year before its graduation. Here we have a list of indicators which compare Bangladesh to the highest performer among the previous LDC graduates. We have indicators such as GNI per capita, human development index, government effectiveness, and uh, ease of doing business, uh, human capital index, and uh, overall productive index. Um, it must be kept in mind that the best performing countries are often very different to Bangladesh in terms of natural resources and economies, so not all of them may be comparable. However, Bangladesh still has a long way to go. Moving on to policy recommendations. Uh, first, we have infrastructural policy recommendations. The first of this is creating an encouraging environment for private and foreign investment. This involves improving supply chain management, investing in infrastructure and improving governance, taxation, and government transparency. The second recommendation is directing official development assistance or ODA towards national priorities. This is something that many previous LDC graduates such as Botswana and Samoa have done. Now moving on to the economic policy recommendations. Firstly, diversifying the economy and exports while employing its human capital, even within the RNG sector, there is a room for a lot of diversification. Secondly, employing policies for labor productivity. Infrastructure development and attention on improving labor productivity is pertinent to Bangladesh in preparation for loss of its LDC perks. This includes streamlining the production process and switching to capital intensive production as a method to remain competitive in the global market. Thirdly, negotiating trade deals. Bangladesh's exports are heavily reliant on the apparel industry, which is expected to increase in tariffs imposed by developed countries. Bangladesh will have to be ready and continue dialogue with the major trading partners for signing free trade agreements, preferential trade agreements, as well as lobby with major countries and trade blocs for signing comprehensive economic partnership agreements, which include trade and investment. Fourthly, managing debt, maintaining foreign reserves. Bangladesh needs to increase the tax to GDP rate, which all previous LDC countries kept high prior to graduation. In addition, having a well-maintained foreign reserve would be benefited by a good remittance flow, which would help tackle the unlikely, uh, sorry, the likely unemployment, underemployment, and inadequate job opportunities after graduation. Another recommendation is taking advantage of the GSP plus scheme. To mitigate the effects of losing EBA preferences, Bangladesh needs to qualify for the GSP plus scheme in order to preserve competitiveness in the export market. 
in order to access this 27 international conventions on labor rights, human rights, environmental protection, and good governance have to be ratified and implemented by the country. Last but not the least, planning for under, under develop, underemployment and skills gaps in the job market. Unemployment, underemployment, and mismatch of skills in the job market are characteristic of a postgraduated economy and hence require special attention. One way to manage this would be to focus on making good economic use of outsourcing and freelancing skills as well, which would be important in raising youth unemployment rates. The last set of policy recommendations we have are focused on governance. The first is preparing the NGO sector for reduced reliance on aid. Bangladesh has been heavily dependent on aid for development and the NGO sector has had a big role in it. Upon graduation, as we will move away from reliance on aid, it is important for the government to prepare its NGO sector for decreased uh, dependence on aid as well. Secondly, planning the management of the impacts of climate change. Because of its geographic region, Bangladesh is particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And so far, we have been able to manage it with the help of the Green Climate Fund. Graduating from LDC means that the fund will no longer be available to us. So we need to plan on how to tackle the impacts of climate change without it. Lastly, promoting increased research and development in the pharmaceutical industry. The pharmaceutical industry in Bangladesh is heavily dependent on the World Trade Organization waiver, which excludes it from agreement on trade related aspects of international property rights or the TRIPS agreement. The shocks from losing this privilege could potentially raise the prices of medicine and health services in Bangladesh. In order to contain this, Bangladesh needs to guide its pharmaceutical industry in increasing research and development and acquiring higher production efficiency to continue to supply the local markets. This was all for our presentation. We have seen the opportunities and challenges that Bangladesh's LDC graduation presents, as well as some policy recommendations based on the experiences of previous LDC graduates. Thank you for your time. We will now get back to the dialogue today. Thank you very much, uh, Anuradha and Raida. Uh, quite a comprehensive, though the time was uh, very limited, but you have made, uh, you, know, you have highlighted almost all the points major points, I would say. So you have uh, highlighted the positive aspects of uh, LDC graduation, which is uh, Bangladesh's confidence um, and also international financial actors confidence on Bangladesh. And also the cost of uh, borrowing will be low because when you know Bangladesh's image and rating goes up, then the financiers will be confident and be more you know, uh, flexible. And then also regarding uh, the other opportunities, for example, FD, uh, foreign direct investment will be flowing in uh, since the, there'll be, you know, the image of the country will go up. Um, but on the other hand, you have also highlighted the challenges which, we'll, uh, which Bangladesh will have to deal with. Of course, the most important one is the you know, relinquishing of preferences and privileges, uh, which comes through various straight preferences, then uh, various um, financial, financial supports from various uh, funds, and also uh, the policy flexibility within the country. Uh, because uh, some sectors of the country, as, as an LDC, we have to provide subsidies, for example, for agriculture. So those flexibility will be also, you know, uh, gone. And uh, lastly, you have a very important, two important points, the climate fund. Uh, some funds will be there, but LDC specific funds will not be uh, there anymore for us. But we know that Bangladesh is such a country which is very vulnerable to the impact of the climate change. And then another important aspect is the pharmaceutical um, uh, sector, because the uh, now we don't have to patent, but our, uh, we have time till uh, the LDCs have the time till 20, uh, 2033. So, uh, but if Bangladesh graduates by 2026, then we will be losing that opportunity. So. You have rightly, you know, mentioned about the policy recommendations. Uh, what policies are, have to be taken uh, 
uh, by the policy makers. Uh, thank you very much. Now I would go straight to uh, the discussion. And uh, as I have mentioned that we are very honored and privileged that we have the um, Honorable Foreign Secretary, Mr. Masood bin Momin with, is with us. Um, I would start with uh, the Mr. Secretary, uh, with, um, you know, before we go into the deeper into the harder issues, but I know that if uh, from the for a long period of your career, you have dealt the issue of LDC graduation and uh, and the LDC graduation of Bangladesh comes at a time when Bangladesh is also celebrating its 58th anniversary. And as we remember that in Bangladesh had been included in the LDC group in 1975. And after four and a half uh, decade, uh, Bangladesh is finally you know, graduating and by 2026, it will graduate. So um, how do you feel? I mean, can you just share with us you know, how you have dealt and what had been the procedure? Um, and also apart from that, as I have mentioned that, how do you feel since you have been dealing with that and finally we have reached the goalpost? So uh, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Samida, uh, for uh, uh, organizing and uh, facilitating uh, this uh, discussion uh, with the youth uh, of Bangladesh and also uh, relevant experts. Uh, let me at the outset uh, uh, for the youth of Bangladesh uh, mention that today happens to be the Foreign Service Day. And on this day, uh, that is uh, 18th April uh, 1971, uh, some of my uh, uh, courageous and bold and patriotic uh, predecessors, uh, they uh, not only defected uh, uh, their uh, Pakistan embassies and high commissions, but uh, a group of them actually hoisted the Bangladesh uh, uh, flag in the Kolkata uh, mission uh, under the clarion uh, call of the father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, just a few days before that. Uh, therefore, uh, we take uh, a lot of pride uh, on this uh, uh, day and achievement of uh, the uh, courageous uh, predecessors, and I pay my respect uh, to all of them, uh, living and dead. Uh, as you have said that uh, I, I had some uh, personal uh, experience uh, dealing with this issue. Uh, but just uh, before that, I would also like to acknowledge uh, Onuradha and uh, Raida's uh, presentation uh, to be very uh, comprehensive. Maybe uh, I can uh, make a few comments uh, at some point of time. Uh, but uh, to begin with, uh, very comprehensive and uh, uh, very uh, thoughtful and thought-provoking as well. Uh, when I was a young uh, diplomat, uh, I don't know how young, but uh, at the age of 28 or 29, uh, I happened to be in uh, New York, uh, Bangladesh permanent mission. And uh, as you may know that uh, there are se several committees in the General Assembly and I was given the responsibility of uh, uh, working in the second committee, which is the economic uh, committee of the UN. And at that time, uh, Bangladesh uh, was uh, the chair or the coordinator of the least developed countries group in uh, New York. Uh, so obviously, uh, uh, my main, uh, one of the main responsibilities uh, was to uh, uh, not only highlight the plight of the LDCs in those days, uh, but also to uh, make sure uh, or ensure uh, that LDCs are mentioned in each of the second committee uh, resolutions and uh, where applicable uh, actionable paragraphs uh, with regard to debt cancellation, uh, trade preferences, technology transfers, all these issues, uh, it was uh, uh, Bangladesh's responsibility to, uh, to uh, negotiate first within the group of 77 and then uh, when the negotiations were opened up with other uh, groups, uh, namely the OECD and, and uh, other uh, developed countries uh, like TANS group, the uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, group, and of course the EU. Uh, therefore, uh, those days, uh, uh, no matter how much uh, uh, I wanted to uh, devote myself to other issues, 
but this issue uh, you know took a lot of time and energy uh, but one uh, experience i can narrate to the young ones here uh, that uh, whenever i entered in any negotiating room uh, my uh, behavior or my uh, my uh, statements uh, uh, were uh, rather predictable and uh, they would uh, whenever i opened my mouth uh, they would immediately uh, know that i will be talking for the ldcs and uh, uh, so as if uh, you know uh, I, I have no other ideas uh, to uh, engage so that was a little bit uh, depressing also at times and therefore uh, when i returned uh, to new york as the permanent representative uh, about uh, 5 years ago uh, from my posting in uh, tokyo uh, again uh, to my uh, surprise uh, i found that uh, bangladesh uh, uh, was uh, earlier elected as the chairman of the least developed countries group and uh, many people uh, told me that it is a, a big honor to represent all these countries and uh, you know uh, i will have a good uh, platform or forum uh, all to uh, bangladesh uh, to advance the causes of the ldc but at the same time use this uh, forum uh, to uh, advance uh, bangladesh's uh, own causes but uh, for me personally it was a kind of a deja vu uh, you know uh, again uh, doing the same thing uh, pleading uh, for ldcs therefore uh, when uh, uh, we uh, did uh, get the opportunity uh, to uh, get out of the ldcs uh, back in 2000 uh, uh, 18, as uh, mentioned by Dr. Fami Khatun, uh, that uh, Bangladesh uh, uh, was considered, uh, along with a few others, uh, to, uh, to by the uh, CDP uh, to uh, graduate. Uh, we took the task very seriously and uh, coordinated uh, with all uh, relevant stakeholders uh, and. Uh, especially in uh, harmonizing uh, some of the you know, statistical uh, uh, problems, uh, data problems, so that uh, we don't uh, miss uh, this opportunity. And uh, luckily for us, uh, you know, with some uh, adjustments, uh, we uh, did pass the first time uh, with uh, flying colors on all the three uh, counts, uh, as mentioned by the two uh, presenters here. Uh, therefore, uh, for me, uh, it is a personal uh, satisfaction. Uh, and uh, for Bangladesh, of course, it's a great uh, uh, you know, landmark that on the 50th uh, anniversary of the, uh, you know, uh, just uh, coming, uh, the advent of the 50th anniversary, uh, we uh, uh, passed the exam, so to say, uh, for the second time and ensure that uh, we are uh, you know, out of the LDC group. Uh, obviously, uh, there are challenges, but I would say uh, there are also uh, lots of opportunities. And therefore, if we can manage the challenges, manage the risks, then we can fully utilize uh, the opportunities so that our, our uh, pathway uh, towards uh, you know, a developing country and then of course, the vision of the Honorable Prime Minister that uh, we should become a prosperous developed country by 2041. That should be our uh, bigger uh, or main goal. Uh, passing uh, LDC is a kind of a uh, means uh, to that uh, uh, final uh, achievement. And for that, uh, we should uh, make sure that this pathway is uh, irreversible and uh, sustainable. Uh, and we should uh, actually look forward uh, to uh, that uh, 2041 uh, goal and how to achieve that. And of course, uh, in that pathway, uh, the graduation uh, challenges uh, have to be, uh, of course, uh, managed uh, well and planned well uh, so that there are no uh, hiccups, at least in our making. There would be uh, challenges, uh, extraneous challenges uh, on, the, on which we may not have enough control, uh, like the COVID uh, uh, crisis or uh, serious depression in our uh, development partner countries or trading partner countries, as well as uh, you know political fallout of uh, neighborhood in the neighborhood like the Rohingya crisis. So uh, you know if those things uh, uh, do not really uh, detract our own. Uh, 
ambitions and uh, efforts, then I think uh, it is uh, possible. So I'll stop at this point and maybe uh, we'll respond to uh, questions or issues. Um, yes, thank you, Ambassador uh, <clears throat> Momin. Um, I, I think it is a it is indeed a moment of pride, uh, and you have firsthand experienced the uh, whole process, and you were there at the time of uh, graduation. So um, I think it is also a lifetime experience, and you are you are uh, you know attached to the history of Bangladesh uh, in 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 some way. Um, so, uh, in your uh, in inaugural speech, you have just uh, mentioned a number of issues, also including the challenges. Of course, you know challenges will be coming on the way, uh, but also opportunities. You know, as uh, we have heard and uh, we have also mentioned about the because the very fact that Bangladesh has graduated it indicates the strength and capacity of the economy, and also there is the it has finally you know, acquired a seal from the global community, uh, from the international organization, which, uh, you know, uh, categorizes um, the countries according to their development achievements. Um, but again, uh, the challenges, some of the challenges are very, very, you know, um, I think uh, if you think in some way, quite daunting in the sense that because the international support measures that are, or the ISMs, so the uh, market access issue, um, various estimations, you know, um, researchers within the country or and also international organizations, they have estimated, um, and it has been estimated that you know there may be a shortfall of uh, export to the tune of you know gross revenue export income might fall you know, by eight to ten percent or equivalent to two point five billion annually. So this is a significant amount, but uh, we are from you also, and also from the policymakers, we are hearing that we will be overcoming, and there is also the uh, prospect of getting uh, some of the duty-free, you know, accesses in some countries. Because right now, as you know, that we get duty-free, quota-free access to the biggest uh, market is the European market. Uh, under the EBA, everything but arms initiative, we get almost you know, uh, 100% duty free access. Uh, and uh, we will, uh, after the graduation, there is a possibility, but then we have to also abide by the stringent the uh, conditionalities. So, to what exactly, you know, what exact policies will uh, Bangladesh have to uh, follow? And this is not also a policy itself but also doing on the ground. So uh, uh, we are hopeful because Bangladesh has, you know, has uh, uh, achieved uh, the milestone. It has been tested, its strength has been tested, but now the bigger challenge is coming. So what do you think that how Bangladesh is going to prepare for that? Thank you. Uh, now we get down to uh, business. Uh, that is uh, how to navigate uh, these uh, difficult times. Uh, these estimates, of course, uh, must have uh, some uh, calculations uh, behind that. Uh, but uh, I would like to first uh, address the issue of uh, market access and also uh, uh, EBA and the GSP uh, uh, facilities that uh, Bangladesh uh, has been used to. Uh, it would be uh, also, uh, you know, uh, partly uh, uh, to our uh, uh, you know, diplomats uh, in uh, Brussels, in Geneva, in New York, and also uh, the relevant, uh, you know, uh, people here uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, other ministries, the ERD and Labor Ministry, uh, Industries Ministry, uh, that uh, we, uh, how we negotiate uh, our uh, path uh, forward. Uh, obviously, uh, the uh, GSP plus negotiations uh, have already uh, started in some way, and uh, we have to uh, make a case uh, for Bangladesh that uh, you know what happens uh, after 2026, uh, and uh, uh, for that uh, we have to uh, make uh, certain adjustments, uh, make some reforms. Uh, Anuradha and Raida mentioned about uh, some uh, international conventions 
uh, to which uh, we can become uh, parties to and uh, basically make the point that uh, uh, you know performance uh, should be uh, rewarded and not punished uh, it was the international community's uh, uh, collective efforts uh, that helped uh, some of these ldcs to uh, come out of uh, that group uh, the last time uh, the the LDC conference uh, mentioned that half of the LDCs uh, should come out uh, within uh, the next uh, LDC conference, uh, which is now scheduled, I think, next year in uh, Qatar. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, you know, not even quarter uh, have uh, managed to do so. Uh, but Bangladesh, uh, with its efforts, uh, we, we did manage uh, to come out of it. And therefore, uh, this good performance uh, should not be uh, punished in a way by arbitrarily uh, withdrawing uh, all these uh, uh, facilities and uh, concessions. Uh, we uh, also managed to get uh, three years uh, extra, but in particular cases, uh, maybe uh, some of these uh, you know, market uh, access uh, is issues uh, can be uh, further uh, pursued. Uh, you mentioned, and I think our presenters also mentioned about pharmaceuticals, uh, that is uh, for uh, LDCs uh, up to 2033, uh, we should be uh, getting uh, all these, uh, you know, trips related uh, benefits, uh, whereby uh, not only the prices of medicines are, uh, can be kept low in Bangladesh, but we have a good, uh, you know, overseas market of our uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, for that, uh, for your information, I'd like to uh, tell you that uh, as we speak, our mission is in Geneva. Uh, remains uh, active in the WTO uh, conversations so that uh, the LDCs uh, which are uh, graduating uh, should get uh, another uh, 12 years after they graduate uh, so that uh, these uh, concessions uh, can uh, continue. Uh, actually, there is a deficit of, uh, you know, uh, 33 and 26, that is uh, four and three, seven years. So uh, we are asking for 12, but uh, if we get uh, less, uh, still, uh, we should be able to uh, manage. And uh, whenever the question of uh, this uh, infant industry argument, as an economist, you will know uh, that infant industry argument sometimes, uh, you know, has its uh, own uh, pitfalls or, or drawbacks. And therefore, uh, we have seen uh, in the past that uh, whenever concessions uh, were withdrawn, uh, our uh, industry leaders uh, they uh, you know managed with their innovation with the skill with the capacity uh, building efforts uh, to cope uh, with the challenges and and uh, ultimately uh, uh, succeed uh, therefore uh, I, I am confident that our uh, pharmaceutical industry uh, over the last few years have gained that experience uh, and also that confidence that even if uh, the facilities are withdrawn uh, we, we can uh, manage uh, to compete now, uh, one issue I'd like to mention, uh, and that is, uh, uh, we did not cover it uh, earlier, uh, which is uh, uh, the advantage uh, of uh, Bangladesh. Uh, first, we have a huge, uh, you know, uh, young population. Uh, our demographic uh, dividend factor, uh, you know, must be uh, fully utilized. And already we are seeing that uh, because of the rise in the middle class, uh, and uh, the benefits of our economic growth uh, during the last uh, decade or so, and the trickle-down effect, uh, and uh, our uh, income equality is still uh, manageable compared to many other uh, countries. Uh, and because of uh, all these factors, combined factors, our domestic demand itself is something uh, quite uh, substantial. And, uh, and evidence of that, I think, uh, was last year, uh, when our markets were closed, when our flights were closed, ports were closed, uh, our uh, you know uh, partner countries, their their markets were closed. But even uh, in that situation, uh, we did manage uh, over five percent, five point four percent to be precise, uh, growth. Uh, and I would attribute that uh, mainly uh, to the strength of our domestic uh, economy and our young people and our. Uh, you know, uh, the purchasing power of our own people. Uh, but 5.4% is not enough if we uh, keep 
in mind uh, the uh, ultimate objective of becoming a prosperous developed country in 2041. Uh, economists have uh, told me that uh, we should be able to manage uh, over 10% growth uh, every year uh, for the remaining years. And that is the real challenge. And I think for that to materialize, uh, there are enough uh, ingredients or components. And one ingredient or component I would like to mention, and that is uh, all the big infrastructure projects uh, that are now underway. Uh, these are not only for Bangladesh. If we combine that with the connectivity, uh, the regional connectivity and all other uh, you know, aspects of connectivity, uh, road connectivity, railway connectivity, uh, uh, you know, uh, maritime connectivity, uh, uh, harnessing the uh, uh, full uh, uh, you know, potential of the blue economy uh, in the Bay of Bengal, uh, and also Bangladesh acting as a bridge between South Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, and also uh, for Nepal and Bhutan. So if we, and also the, uh, the Northeastern states of India, so if we combine all this, then I think uh, we can uh, actually uh, cross uh, that uh, threshold of uh, 10%. Uh, so we have our own uh, you know, power uh, to uh, sustain uh, the growth, maybe up to 5%, but then this rest uh, of the growth, uh, uh, at least 2-3%. And I would urge young economists uh, to do the research uh, in this regard that uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, actual economic growth. I read somewhere that uh, Podda Bridge, uh, when uh, it is materialized itself, will add about 2%. So if we can uh, uh, you know, uh, give some numbers uh, to these big projects like Matar Bari, uh, like uh, our, uh, you know, all the power uh, projects, and also uh, all these uh, connectivity uh, uh, possibilities, uh, uh, many of you have seen that uh, uh, that uh, the month of uh, March this year, uh, one uh, bridge was opened uh, between Bangladesh and uh, India called the Feni Bridge. Now, uh, Feni Bridge, you know, uh, if we can, uh, uh, you know, get all the infrastructure ready by next year or a couple of years, then that itself will generate uh, some uh, extra uh, growth uh, in terms of uh, trade and other uh, facilities. So this is just one example. So I would uh, request uh, my uh, you know young uh, uh, friends here, if we can do that uh, research uh, as to uh, you know the true potential of connectivity in the region. Uh, Bangladesh uh, has uh, has been uh, mentioning this, has been raising this with all our neighbors. Uh, you know that between uh, 17 and 26, 27th of March, uh, five heads of states and heads of government uh, from the region came. And with all of them, we uh, raised this issue and we uh, received a very positive uh, uh, response. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, we believe that uh, uh, you know, these things uh, will take some time, uh, but uh, all these infrastructure projects, we, uh, if we add them, then they can uh, work as a growth uh, multiplier and, and then we can actually look for uh, this 10% uh, 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 growth rate uh, possible. And of course, uh, we uh, will have to, uh, to remain uh, competitive. We have to uh, you know, uh, try to make uh, trade uh, preferential agreements with uh, many countries. We have just started with Bhutan, but next uh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and then uh, with some of the ASEAN countries and also uh, the RCEP agreement. So we should uh, look very seriously to this so that uh, we can remain uh, competitive. And, uh, and, uh, and Bangladesh, uh, you know, getting out of LDC will also add uh, as a kind of a, a new uh, branding for Bangladesh. And that will, uh, and if we do a good, uh, you know, uh, publicity, then investment uh, can increase and uh, because of all these infrastructure projects. And uh, uh, the world, uh, the credit ratings for Bangladesh will also uh, improve, uh, which uh, uh, will give us the opportunity to uh, even uh, issue uh, sovereign bonds and other uh, kinds of, uh, from the international market, our private sector people can, uh, can uh, raise uh, funds. Uh, so there will be uh, more opportunities. Uh, ODA was mentioned, how to align them with the national priorities, uh, important. 
but ODA itself is, uh, you know, has decreased substantially over the years. Uh, when uh, Dr. Famida and uh, we were studying economics in Dhaka University and uh, Jahanginagar University, and we did uh, participate in a course in BIDS uh, in our uh, mid 20s. And uh, there, uh, at that time, uh, we saw that uh, you know, a large part of our ADP was financed uh, by uh, ODA. But now that uh, you know, percentage is actually quite low. Uh, therefore, uh, you know, we, we should. Uh, think uh, more independently as to how uh, we can actually uh, live uh, without uh, depending uh, on, on basic things uh, from the development partners. So uh, there are other few points, but maybe we'll uh, take them. Thank, thank you very much. I think you have uh, uh, painted a vast picture. You brought the issue of uh, youth uh, population, demographic dividend, then the uh, contribution of the, and also in the importance of domestic market, and then the pharmaceutical issues, trade issues, the issue of subsidies and all, uh, but they, and how to also go about it and what are the strengths of Bangladesh in these areas. You mentioned about the connectivity. So uh, a lot of uh, potential is in fact uh, lying in how, how uh, we can improve our connectivity within the country and also uh, with our regional um, neighbors, uh, basically. And but I um, also, you know, uh, uh, want to raise one point. Uh, we are talking about the youth population and demographic dividend, but one thing uh, we also have to be mindful here as we proceed is that uh, how we can take advantage of this demographic dividend because after uh, a few years um, the population uh, scientists or demographers they say that by 2035 we may lose these demographic dividends we may not be able to take advantage of that so with the, we have a narrow window of opportunity we have to actually um, upgrade the skills of the young population uh, and also engage them in productive activities. And also the, in fact, you, you are very true that now we uh, also have to um, focus on our domestic market a lot because, uh, you know, 16 or 17 million uh, people, uh, uh, 170 million people, it, it is a large market for for us, and in fact, the investors also look up to Bangladesh uh, that the, uh, the opportunities for their investment. Um, so, and uh, at this point in time, I would bring uh, two of our uh, fellows are here, YPF fellows. And since you have mentioned about the pharmaceutical sector, and then you know we have uh, the strength of uh, you know the industry, and we have a number of um, pharmaceutical industries which have the capacity uh, of any world-class uh, you know, manufacturing unit. Even then, we are not being able to tap many markets. There are you know, uh, bottlenecks uh, in terms of exports. I don't know, you know specifically why they are, when, when we discuss with the people who are in the sector, they uh, you know, bring out a number of regulatory issues uh, also, uh, one of them is also that, you know, how to import for importing the ingredients and all, uh, a huge amount of uh, uh, financial resources is uh, required. And then also the maintaining the compliance is very, very stringent because, you know, of course, this is an issue with the life and uh, death. So I would... Um, now request our uh, fellow, uh, Mr. Nakibur Rahman, who has the experience in these sectors, that um, how can we, you know, take advantage? Because as you know, in the, in the WTO, the issue of patenting, that has been, the timeline had been extended a couple of, uh, you know, times actually. Uh, but we have not been able to take advantage of that. And now by 2026, when we will graduate, we will not be able to you know, uh, take that opportunity further. So we only have five years in hand. 
do you think that is it possible to um, uh, to take advantage of this uh, WTO um, WTO uh, trade related the opportunity within the WTO uh, which is about the trade related aspects of the intellectual property rights trips which gives flexibility um, in terms of uh, protection patenting the pharmaceutical products Mr. Nagibur Rahman yes thank you Dr. Samida. Um, I think uh, uh, what uh, our Honorable Foreign Secretary was highlighting that this 2024 time like might, might be extended further. We might have a few additional years of uh, waiver, uh, be it 12 years or uh, whether it coincides with the 2033 timeline. So anyway, this cessation of uh, waiver is foreseen much before this graduation discussion uh, came into table. So uh, the industry had always been discussing this uh, possibility of cessation of this waiver. And now we have to see what it means for us. Now, coming directly to the question Dr. Farmida asked uh, whether we have been able to take uh, advantage, we will be able to take further advantage within the next five years or X many years we have. Uh, in terms of exporting our pharmaceuticals into highly regulated first world countries, probably we haven't been able to take full advantage. But if we talk about catering to the local demand, internal demand, I think we have taken full, full advantage of that. Uh, uh, if, you, if you look into the current, uh, uh, you know, uh, drug supply chain, 95% uh, of the producers are, are come, coming from our local manufacturers. So that this self-dependence, it has uh, uh, in, in, in a great way been supported by this WTO waiver. Of course, we had a great uh, pharmaceuticals or a healthcare policy in place. Uh, particularly the drug policy that was formulated in 1982 that helped a lot and that was supported or sponsored further by the WTO waiver on patents. Now uh, coming to this cessation of uh, patent waiver, uh, whatever the timeline be, what it means for the local pharma industry. If we look at the uh, current market, 80% of the drugs we produce and consume locally are off patent. These are very old molecules, very old chemical entities. The rest 20%, these are patented. And out of this 20% patented products, five to 8% patented products are produced and marketed in Bangladesh by the original patent owners. So like the uh, much talked about product actum, of the COVID patients are, uh, you know, looking everywhere. So this is marketed by its uh, patent uh, owner, Roche itself. Uh, if we take this five to 8% out, another 12 to 15% of products, which are local companies produce are actually copy versions of global patented products where we actually enjoy this benefit of this waiver. Now, if we have um, I think uh, Mr. Rahman's um, internet is not stable. I think we can't hear it. Um, let me just move. Uh, we'll uh, we'll get back to him when his lines are better. I think um, in this uh, context, I would also bring in uh, Samuel Hawk, who has the expertise on nanotechnology and en engineering. He is also a senior fellow entrepreneurship and future thinking of YPF. So related to this uh, trips issue, the uh, least developed countries also enjoy the um, uh, the technology transfer issue because uh, uh, the um, under article 66.1 of trips agreement the um, issue of technology transfer scheme has been mentioned that ldcs will should be provided uh, technologies and um, and uh, so once um, the uh, uh, the Bangladesh graduates from LDC category. Uh, this will also, you know, go away. Uh, and uh, as you know, that many uh, right now being an LDC, we don't have to, you know, register for many uh, many issues. Many we can use. Uh, we can have you know uh, use the special compulsory licensing for uh, many uh, many technologies. In fact. So that advantages, uh, once it goes away, it might have an impact on the 
education because we are using. Uh, sorry, I, I think I, I just. Okay, uh, you are back. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get back to you. Yeah. I was posing yeah. a question to Mr. Uh, Hawk, uh, Samuel Hawk, regarding the LDC uh, advantage or benefit in terms of technology transfer, access to technology transfer under the TRIPS agreement. So how do we, because it will also mean that, you know, many books we can download freely now, we can watch movies, uh, so, but yes. these, will, these facilities will not be there anymore. So how do we tackle that and what kind of, uh, of course it will require government policy uh, which might also need uh, more investment in the education sector and technology. So Mr. Samuel Hawk, if you have your reflections on this. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hamida Khatun. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in this panel and uh, say a few words uh, regarding this uh, LDC intellectual property development aspect uh, related to Bangladesh. Um, there were many interesting and important points raised by uh, many of the uh, speakers here and also the presentation that highlighted the IP aspects. And you mentioned about what will happen in terms of upon graduation and why we are in the transition period. So I just wanted to say that um, Bangladesh's main challenges, like each challenge provides you with opportunities. So the main challenge is to keep moving up the technological ladder and creating and adding value and moving from the low cost production mentality. So giving something with quality, with some price, which is competitive would be very interesting. But at the same time, we must actually reform our intellectual property standards. And that will play a vital role for the future of the country. And so what are intellectual property rights? I want to just say one word about it, that, that these are said to incentivize innovation by preventing free writing or copying and increasing the rewards from investments. So what Bangladesh can do is, uh, for example, when you look abroad, um, a country like China, out of let's say two and a half million patents which are produced worldwide applications, they are doing 50% of that. And India is doing let's say 20,000 every year. And India has invested heavily in sort of various different infrastructures, R&D centers, and driving that innovation that also from the pharmaceutical perspective might become very important. And in the education uh, area, we need to have awareness, number one, and number two, you know, create IP law and IP awareness across various spectrum in industries and in educational institutions, because at the end of the day, you will need IP attorneys and the skill gap that we have. I think that needs to be fulfilled, at least to understand how we can face these challenges when we graduate. Uh, two important points I want to raise very briefly is that, that there needs to be some kind of legislation in Bangladesh that probably five to 10% of these operating profits of companies have to be reinvested in R&D projects. Because this is how, if you look into the developed countries, they spend millions to billions in R&D projects, but that is a sunk cost, frankly. So what is the benefit of that? So either you create an innovation that they can license and produce um, or monetize that. And the government, what they do is subsidize those companies. So they, they give you tax credits, they give you subsidy because you're investing five to 10% of your profits back to innovation. So this will help to raise the bar of Bangladesh, not from a production perspective, but actually creating new things that we can also license abroad. Uh, a typical example could be Orsaline. Um, if we were patenting such ideas and licensing it abroad, you could be generating funds uh, for the companies and the different uh, infrastructure for Bangladesh, uh, where industries have a major role to play. So I think uh, in short, we need a roadmap for this implementation. And uh, it, it's my also personal 
um, opinion that we should be investing probably in in, uh, in billions for for the technology innovation sector, uh, and we should have a roadmap for five, 10, 15 years that these disbursements would be in place. And also, central bank has a major role that. If you imagine some of these companies setting up pharmaceutical companies or technological companies, they need to have the funds as well for licensing this technology. So in the loan disbursement as well, some of these elements need to be coming into place. So these are some of the important aspects I think Bangladesh needs to look forward to. Uh, which I want um, to Thank highlight. you very much. Um, I would uh, go back to Mr. Rahman, who he uh, was uh, discussing the pharmaceutical uh, industries um, aspects, and uh, I think we should uh, now finish his, yeah. uh, his yeah, so, remarks. Yes. Yeah, Mark is it always you know <laughs> uh, happens at the right moment. The line was all good. It started, you know. Yeah, no, so. if you just you know quickly. Um, uh, guide us that what could be why we could not take advantage and why what could, let's imagine that we don't have uh, extension of course there will be yeah. because i've mentioned many times it has been extended yeah. but how do we yeah. you know take that advantage within yeah. these five years exactly at, at any point in time it will go so uh, now as i was telling 80 percent of the drugs you produce and consume are off patent so the uh, medicine you take for your regular fever your gastric acidity problems, uh, your cough and cold problems, we will have continued availability of that. The pricing, uh, again, thanks to our uh, local drugs policy, the health ministry and drug administration, the way they controls uh, drug price in Bangladesh, it is unlikely that these products, this 80% of this regularly consumed medicine will uh, you know, uh, have an unusual hike in price. Now, coming back to that remaining 20%, what are the products there? If you uh, uh, put them into three baskets, some products are advanced or newer versions of traditional therapies. So 20 years back, when you had gastric acidity, you had a chewable antacid. Then you started omeprazole, then you started esomeprazole, now you're taking dexlansoprazole. So this dexlansoprazole product probably is a patented product. Uh, is it uh, uh, highly efficacious compared to the previous version? Probably no. You will uh, have all sorts of, uh, you know, efficacy from the previous versions, you will get your gastric acidity heart burns treated, but probably this newer molecules comes with some sort of, uh, you know, uh, convenience, probably the doses once a day instead of twice a day, probably the new drug you can take with or without regard to meal, whereas earlier you had to take it two years before, two hours before meal. So that sort of advantage. So if these sort of products become unavailable, probably there will be no healthcare disaster. But where will you see a healthcare crisis? It will be the diseases of the new world. New world. Look into the uh, you know, anti-cancer portfolio. So now, uh, as, we, as we graduate, as we, as we become, you know, our, our life ex expectancy is going up, we will have diseases of the new world. We will have more chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, that too are manageable with traditional medicine. But if you look into the, uh, you know, difficult to treat, diseases, difficult to manufacture drugs like anti-cancer drugs that is already expensive despite availability of local generic versions, it is already not affordable to many of us. Now, if this patent waiver goes away, this anti-cancer drug, rheumatoid arthritis drugs, uh, thalassemia drugs, these type of drugs will become more and more expensive, more and more unavailable. Now, uh, one way forward uh, everyone talks about is that, okay, we, we have become a, a, a very good country in reverse engineering of products. We have done excellence in manufacturing, excellent in copying, but we need to invest and Um, I think we have lost uh, Mr. Rahman again. Now, uh, okay, we'll uh, okay, I'll give him opportunity, um, you know, towards the end again. Uh, I would uh, come back to uh, Ambassador Moment again. Uh, I would like to know from you, uh, Ambassador Moment, that um, now that we have uh, we are graduating, so does it also mean that you know we will be on our own? 
and there will be no uh, you know no support or no collaboration cooperation from international community sorry um, i am again having to connect from a uh, different uh, name Amaro, just... yeah so we'll we'll get back to you later on yeah. uh, so yeah. i'm just you know posing a, a question to ambassador momen so uh, as we know that you know it doesn't necessarily uh, be so because uh, we have seen there is this ldc group which is uh, which is submitting various proposals for the you know uh, for having more time for you know graduation more time in the preparation time that you know after graduation enjoying for enjoying the facilities for another 12 years we, you have mentioned about that and also we know that the uncdp uh, that had uh, prepared a proposal for special monitoring mechanism for these countries for the ldcs and also they have uh, suggested for launching a graduation support facility so uh, but these these are proposals these are these also mean that uh, from the country level and also as an ldc group these have to be moved forward together and uh, you know you have to argue for that or you have to make a case for this um, so how bangladesh is doing in the international uh, arena uh, in order to take forward for Bangladesh graduation. Thank you. Uh, that could be a good uh, conclusion uh, for our uh, discussions. Uh, but before uh, doing that, uh, let me uh, briefly touch on some of the issues uh, mentioned uh, by uh, uh, the two uh, speakers uh, just uh, before. Uh, first, uh, on the pharmaceutical front, uh, uh, yes, uh, I mean, uh, we uh, may face uh, uh, certain difficulties, uh, but uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, we have uh, opened up uh, dialogue uh, with uh, relevant uh, stakeholders, uh, first uh, with the uh, leaders of our uh, pharmaceutical uh, uh, sector, uh, you know, uh, and also uh, with the leaders of ICT and uh, leaders of uh, uh, jute and uh, textiles, as well as uh, leaders uh, on uh, leather sector. Uh, first important thing is, uh, you know, we have to diversify our export uh, basket. Uh, there is no, uh, uh, you know, doubt or question about that. And number two is also, uh, we have to diversify our uh, destinations uh, for our products. So uh, we are uh, gearing up our uh, our embassies, and also uh, that's why we have been meeting with stakeholders. Uh, our, uh, you know, pharmaceutical industry leaders uh, mentioned uh, to us that uh, uh, as of now, most of the active uh, pharmaceutical ingredients or API are being imported, uh, uh, and uh, so that's uh, kind of a uh, handicap, especially if the supply chain, uh, if that is disrupted or broken, as we have seen uh, during the early days of COVID. Uh, therefore, uh, but they assured us that uh, very soon uh, uh, they were also preparing, maybe if not this year, but from next year, uh, they will be producing some of these APIs, and that would be a major uh, leap uh, forward. Uh, and uh, and also our embassies uh, can work uh, hand in hand with the uh, pharmaceutical industry to uh, reach out uh, to some of the you know uh, markets. Uh, with uh, you know highly uh, regulatory uh, you know uh, uh, framework uh, or, or uh, you know, complicated uh, uh, you know, licensing procedures, so they can uh, work together uh, to navigate uh, these uh, you know uh, uncharted uh, territories. Uh, uh, and I am confident that you know our people are are uh, innovative enough and uh, competitive enough uh, that when uh, there is pressure. Uh, they, they come out uh, successful. They're very resilient. It's not only our farmers who are resilient, but I think in general, Bangladesh is uh, uh, quite uh, resilient uh, to uh, you know, rise up to the occasion uh, when the challenge comes. On uh, ICT, uh, you know, uh, our uh, speaker uh, mentioned uh, some of the uh, opportunities, uh, but I think the most important thing there also, uh, you know, how to uh, uh, educate uh, our uh, young uh, population and the quality of education was mentioned earlier. And uh, I think the ICT uh, superstructure is there. 
uh, and uh, we have uh, no depth of uh, talents. Every year we see a lot of our chaps uh, getting uh, awards uh, in, in, in maths Olympiads or even robotics and all that stuff. Uh, but uh, there is no institutional uh, mechanism, uh, you know, uh, as such, uh, either from the industry or from the government agencies to support these uh, young talents. Uh, so if we can do that, then, uh, you know, maybe some money could be wasted, but then out of 10, uh, you know, uh, budding, uh, you know, talents, uh, if two or three uh, succeed, uh, then uh, I think, uh, you know, we can actually uh, uh, see some uh, uh, exponential uh, growth possibilities. Uh, right now, uh, Bangladesh is doing quite good in terms of freelancing and uh, for that, uh, I mean, through this, uh, we can, uh, ICT products, uh, we can also uh, improve our uh, growth uh, trajectory uh, exponentially. Uh, one thing uh, that was not uh, mentioned, uh, but before that again, uh, technology transfer is important. And I think uh, the LDC Technology Bank, uh, for the establishment of which we did uh, quite uh, uh, some homework uh, when we were in New York, uh, in fact, Bangladesh was one of the main countries, uh, you know, by seeing its uh, fruition uh, in uh, uh, in uh, uh, Turkey, uh, and uh, we can take advantage uh, for some years to come uh, from this uh, technology bank as far as technology transfer and dissemination is concerned, and also nurturing uh, uh, the young uh, technologists uh, from the uh, least developed country groups. Uh, uh, and, and uh, the point that was uh, missed is the uh, question of remittance. Uh, remittance uh, being an important uh, uh, driving force of our economy. Uh, we were all uh, quite afraid uh, during the first round of COVID uh, when uh, you know, uh, in the Middle East and some other countries they were pushing our workers uh, from these countries. Uh, we wanted to slow it down uh, and uh, were reasonably successful. And now again, uh, you know, uh, the flow has uh, started. And that's why uh, even during this lockdown, we were actually arguing uh, for opening a few uh, you know, routes uh, from uh, as of yesterday, and we'll continue to do that uh, so that these opportunities are not lost. Uh, but uh, this uh, quality of the uh, uh, workers, uh, uh, the remittance, or if you say the quality of the remittance, of course, remittance is just money. Uh, that uh, we can also, uh, uh, really uh, uh, leverage uh, by uh, giving them a more skill uh, and, and their uh, earnings uh, will increase. So even if the number of people uh, does not increase, but uh, if we can improve their quality, their skills, then uh, we can uh, continue to do uh, good. So this is uh, another uh, you know, uh, plus point. Uh, one thing I missed, and that is uh, uh, as we go for more uh, uh, preferential trading arrangements and uh, and uh, you know free trade arrangements. Uh, obviously, uh, our dependence on indirect taxes uh, will uh, you know uh, will bound to decrease, and that's when uh, uh, already low tax GDP ratio will be under uh, serious uh, uh, strain, and and we have to improve uh, the tax collection uh, machinery to improve the tax GDP ratio, which is uh, quite low at the moment. And, uh, and again, uh, navigate how to uh, uh, compensate uh, the loss in indirect taxation uh, if, if there are more and more uh, you know, uh, trading uh, blocks or uh, trading uh, groups. Uh, so these are some of the issues I thought uh, I'll just quickly uh, mention. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much. I think we had a, a you know, very, uh, elaborate discussion but still the issue is so vast there are many aspects and i had a, a a number of questions in my mind but in the interest of time i can't really pose that maybe in a future session but at this point in time i would open the floor for q and a question and answer from the audience so um, i don't know how many have uh, posed questions so if anyone can help me with the questions is there any question Um, Samira? 
So I can see in the you know, chat you box the a number of. Uh, yeah, so. I'm the right. Yes, box. yeah, I, I can uh, see a few questions. So um, there, there's a question uh, for Mr. Nakib Rahman from Dr. Akhtar Mahmood, who is also an advisor of YPF. So he's asking that the pharmacy industry has been asking for an API part for many years and have argued that this is essential for their growth. Why has this part not materialized yet? If it is so important for the industry, so Mr. Yes, Mr. Rahman, uh, I think yeah, there is another question for yes. you, similar, think, uh, yes. similar in line with that. Yeah, yeah, same question asked twice. Yes, so basically asking for the API part, why it has not been implemented yet? Okay, I think uh, the API part was much hyped. Um, then, then what was the real potential of it? And uh, despite so much, uh, you know, uh, discussion on this and so many incentives, last time the government said that if we can produce and export APIs, we'll have 20% cash incentive, but still it hasn't, uh, uh, you know, kicked off in a good way. The reason behind this is scale. When China and India is producing APIs, they are producing it for the whole world. And if I'm only producing for myself, the scale is never going to satisfy the price point that we want to sell products in. So that is the major reason. Now, if we want to manufacture very high priced APIs, I, I come back again to uh, the difficult to make uh, products like anti-cancer products where one kilogram of uh, API will cost you probably eight to $10,000. If you manufacture that, if the uh, if volume is still low, it's okay. But uh, for uh, other products uh, where my selling price is 80 Porsche per tablet, uh, probably their scale comes into play and we are not competitive enough against India or China who is manufacturing it for the whole world. Yes, we should definitely be talking to global partners as Honorable Foreign Secretary was telling that uh, we need to uh, have more partnerships and we, we need to enter into a global market, not only the local market, which Dr. Farmida was also uh, highlighting a couple of times that uh, have we really taken the advantage or can we take the advantage? So I think uh, we really need to look into it, whether uh, API manufacturing uh, is the uh, best resort or whether it is uh, going to materialize, it's, it's really going to be uh, feasible enough in the long run, that is one thing. Uh, another one thing I couldn't finish in my earlier discussion, thanks to uh, uh, our foreign secretary, he covered a lot of ground from pharma. One important way forward we, we, we all need to discuss, uh, as much as we want, as much as we dream, we are unlikely to get prepared and we are unlikely to become able to manufacture uh, original R&D based products. I was uh, talking about the 20% therapy area, like the difficult to treat area where most of our challenges will be. Our uh, senior citizens population is going to grow because our higher life expectancy and all. But if we don't have affordable products, available products, we will struggle to treat those diseases. And you, you cannot uh, you know, prepare uh, the industry so quickly for that type of a scenario. It requires an entire ecosystem starting from academia to industry to the you know, R&D circuit. So one important thing is that we need to talk more about economic policies around demand side financing. Look into Sri Lanka. Every cancer patient receives a cash uh, sponsorship of 20 lakh rupees from the government so that they can go and buy anti-cancer medicine. So after five years, eight years, when we don't have this patent production, our local companies are unable to copy or reverse engineer those, uh, you know, advanced molecules, uh, super efficacious molecules. So are you How suggesting for these measures like, you know, uh, Sri Lanka, what has been done in Sri Lanka, yeah. uh, could we do it? Is it feasible for Bangladesh? We have to think about it, be it uh, demand side financing, be it some sort of uh, insurance programs, because yes, even if the price goes up, whoever is currently being able to afford, probably that small percentage, at top of the pyramid will continue to afford. But what happens down the line? What happens middle of the pyramid, bottom of the pyramid? We have to think about some sort of economic model. The solution is not in that the local industry becomes capable enough to manufacture all on their own. We still um, have some sort of dependency. How do we tackle that? Probably that should be some sort of economic policy discussion.
question for you. I, I see there's a lot of interest in pharmaceuticals and pharmacy medicine, or for obvious reasons, of course. Uh, this this question is regarding the vaccines. Uh, um, Mr. Muhammad Johirul Kayum, he is asking, what about vaccines after graduation? Now, most of the vaccines are supplied by WHO Gavi to Bangladesh at reduced rate or free of cost. The prices of foreign vaccines at regular commercial rate will shoot up after graduation. How do we tackle this uh, crisis going forward? Uh, so, yeah, a very pertinent question. Uh, yes, the Gavi program sponsors uh, three or four uh, vaccines, but the entire EPI program has probably more vaccines, nine or 10 vaccines. So not all of our vaccines are uh, dependent on the Gavi uh, subsidy. Then again, the Gavi follows a different scale, not the uh, you know uh, uh, scale of LDC development. Country. They follow the World Bank scale based on economy. And whenever you graduate from LIC to LMIC, uh, you have to opt in for a co-pay model. So when you are a LIC, not the LDC, that's a different scale I'm sure you are all aware about. So if you're an LIC, uh, the Gavi gives most of the vaccines for free. When you are an LMIC, uh, you have to go for a co So LIC for the audience, of course, you know, low income uh, country and LMIC lower middle income country. These are, this is a category of uh, World Bank. Exactly. As opposed to the... Yeah, so the Gavi sponsorship is uh, that scale, not this LDC or developing country scale. So we already are co-paying for a lot of vaccines. Uh, so it, it's not fully subsidized by Gavi. Uh, yes, of course, uh, but this will also have an impact, although uh, our, our area of discussion was uh, graduating from LDC, but that is a very pertinent question. Uh, but uh, to be honest, uh, not all of our vaccines are sponsored by the Gavi program. Probably 20 to 25 percent of the funding comes from Gavi. The rest is uh, from different sources and, and, and local funding. But uh, then again, the essential vaccines, the, the, the six vaccines the child must take, uh, these are not funded by Gavi. Some of the uh, supplementary vaccines, which are also considered essential, uh, but uh, to a next level, these are, these are supported by Gavi. We will have to have our preparedness. Uh, here we uh, can have support from the local industry. We, we cannot manufacture vaccine from basic seed, but we have the ability to uh, do the next level of uh, production, like uh, bringing in uh, bulk. We can also invite FDI, right? Can we Exactly, not? exactly. We have that platform. We have that uh, uh, manpower. We have that infrastructure. So the starting material that, that comes from the giants, if we have partnerships, if we invite them to do joint ventures with us, probably we can have uh, lower cost vaccines uh, where we will uh, have reduced or withdrawn GAVI support. Thank you. Thank you very much. There is, uh, there are, uh, I think, two, three questions more. Uh, from Bijoy Bhattacharji, he has mentioned that has, in true sense, any technology transfer occurred under Article 66.2 of TRIPS? Has any proof that developed members incentivize their enterprises to transfer technology? I really wonder. So I think in your question, you, you have indicated the response also. Yes, it is unfortunate. I think, you know, in true sense, the technology transfer has not been, uh, has not happened. Uh, in fact, because we also see that there is a, uh, you know, we encourage that for LDCs, there should not be, the profit motive should not be there. So it should be in two sense technology transfer and it should be state of the art technology, not just, you know, dumping technology. So these are a lot of debates on this issue in, and the debate go, goes on. Uh, so the next question is again from... Uh, uh, Akhtar Mahmood, uh, he is asking me this question. The discussion has brought out the importance of innovation and the need for government support, including subsidies, to promote innovation. Do you think that so far government subsidies have been used more to maintain the status quo, for example, in the RMG industry, rather than to promote change? Um, um, this is a yeah. This is a really tough question. Yes, uh, the issue of subsidy it is uh, highly debated, and where the subsidies um, uh, are going and how uh, it has been utilized that's an issue because uh, as you have mentioned that yes, there is one sector has been benefited 
um, disproportionately than others, uh, in fact, though our agriculture sector receives uh, some uh, amount of subsidies, but as you know that this is also very important because uh, uh, for food security, this, uh, uh, these subsidies and incentives are very, very crucial for Bangladesh and particularly in a country where uh, the per, cap per capita income is low. And uh, so that's why um, I mm, would uh, I think in line with what you have just suggested or indicated that yes, uh, for innovation, because as we are talking about um, the graduation, smooth graduation and sustainable graduation, I think, you know, the, from the discussion of the speakers also have come out, I think if I can pick up three issues, that is one has been mentioned that the diversification, diversification of not only the exports, but also the economic diversification, uh, not just focused uh, on one particular sector, but you know, the potential sectors, including uh, RMG, including other export oriented uh, sectors, agriculture sector, um, rural development. So uh, diversification is very, very important so that we don't, you know, get um, uh, victim, become, uh, you know, vulnerable to any crisis. The second one is the importance on technological upgradation, uh, because this is a, a, an era we have entered into. This is an era where uh, productivity is most important because we are talking about increasing the competitiveness to survive in the local market and also in the global market because we have to compete with many um, countries particularly you know countries like china and other advanced developing countries in the global market so how do we uh, compete with that um, uh, at a time when we are also you know asking for uh, and emphasizing for the a higher pay of workers, higher skills. So technological upgradation is, is the key and crucial at this point in time. Uh, and the third one, of course, related to that is the improvement of labor productivity. Skills development has been highlighted by the uh, Foreign Secretary. Uh, in fact, um, the, the fourth industrial re revolution, which has ushered in already, uh, and which has been expedited during COVID uh, situation, during the ongoing COVID pandemic, um, the, and it will take up you know, more places in our day-to-day -day lives. So the improvement of labor product productivity uh, through technological upgradation uh, uh, is uh, uh, very, very important. So economic diversification, technological upgradation, labor productivity um, will be uh, the key uh, aspects of uh, going of our economy going forward, um, you know, to to make it more efficient and effective. Uh, so the uh, I think there is another question from Mr. Khaled uh, Mahfouz Saeed. Can Ministry of Foreign Affairs prepare a rule to stop job application from unskilled persons, rather promoting skilled workers for overseas job? So I would now um, you know uh, pose this question to hand over this question to uh, Ambassador Momen. I think there's another question to you also. Uh, that is from Abir Hassan Niloy, co-founder of YPF. As part of YPF, can we talk, can we work with the Foreign Secretary in helping him with the research on graduation? And, um, and also he again and I posed another question. As part of YPF, can we work? Oh, this is the same question, can, has come together, can, can come twice, I think. So two questions. Uh, first one is the skilled uh, workers overseas and then uh, YPF's involvement in supporting the foreign affairs uh, work. Thank you. Uh, well, this is a basic uh, fundamental rights question. Uh, of course, our preference uh, would be uh, to uh, send uh, only, uh, you know, skilled workers or semi-skilled workers and not to send uh, unskilled workers. Uh, but uh, if there is a demand uh, in some countries and uh, if uh, people uh, would like to go, then, uh, you know, it would be a kind of infringement of their uh, right uh, to uh, pursue. Uh, livelihood uh, in, in another country. Uh, so uh, to answer your question, uh, uh, there uh, should not be any legal bar uh, for anybody to pursue. Uh, uh, and the similar case uh, in point is also, uh, you know, in the Middle East, we have seen uh, some abuses of some, uh, you know, of our uh, uh, lady workers. Uh, then the question is, you know, should we or should we not 
uh, obviously uh, you know, we should not uh, uh, stop uh, anyone uh, from uh, pursuing uh, their uh, uh, livelihood uh, options but uh, we have to make sure that uh, our uh, you know redressal mechanism is strong enough our uh, reaction uh, or our uh, response is uh, uh, humane and uh, quick uh, so that uh, uh, they are not uh, abused uh, uh, just to uh, go back to this question of uh, vaccines uh, if i may uh, right now the whole world is desperate uh, to uh, not only develop uh, vaccines but also to get uh, vaccines uh, and uh, just a couple of days ago uh, 170 uh, you know former world leaders and uh, and nobel laureates uh, appealed to president biden uh, to waiver uh, these uh, vaccine uh, patent that the americans uh, have developed uh, mainly uh, pfizer uh, uh, then Moderna and uh, Johnson and Johnson, and maybe a few others. Uh, so uh, you know th these uh, can give uh, opportunities uh, to countries like Bangladesh. Uh, some of our uh, pharmaceutical uh, leading pharmaceutical companies like uh, Incepta or Beximco, uh, and, and maybe a few others, uh, they may have uh, you know uh, readiness uh, to uh, do this. Uh, and uh, right now we are actively pursuing with uh, the Russians and also the Chinese uh, and also uh, we have earlier offered the Indians uh, for uh, co-production of uh, COVID uh, vaccine. And, uh, you know, uh, if, if our uh, uh, industry is strong enough, then who knows, uh, by the end of the year, uh, we can be uh, producing uh, uh, the COVID uh, vaccine in Bangladesh. Uh, so uh, the question is uh, how confident we are, how capable we are how the government uh, can respond as a facilitator uh, and uh, uh, we, we can uh, do the job not only for our domestic uh, market but for uh, other uh, countries as well. Uh, what was the other question, the last question, sorry, I forgot. The other question uh, or request is that uh, whether YPF colleagues can, um, okay. you know, um, yeah. can work. So, uh, or... We are uh, always open uh, to talk to uh, as many uh, stakeholders as possible, especially uh, uh, youth of Bangladesh. Uh, although uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, uh, do not have uh, the means to engage uh, different uh, groups, but uh, we can do the matchmaking and uh, we can always uh, start the conversation if young people are interested to uh, contribute to the policy discussions or inputs uh, then they are uh, more than uh, welcome uh, so please uh, contact my office and uh, i am ready to uh, engage uh, with the, the youth of bangladesh because i think they are our future and whatever uh, we are doing here uh, at the end of the day, it is for uh, the youth of Bangladesh who are our uh, future. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very encouraging because uh, what we see that uh, in the private sector or in the non-government sector, there is opportunity for uh, you know internship and for skills development before they really enter to the real job market. But we don't have the, that opportunity in the government sector. But uh, if I, there is a, I think in a, from your uh, from your assurance, we feel encouraged that if there is any opportunity, you will provide uh, support to the you know young researchers so that they can be engaged in research in helping you. I mean, they will be. I think many other uh, organizations are coming up with this, and this is going to be a, a you know platform which uh, will create the future leaders. Uh, this is very encouraging and thank you very much. The YPF members look forward to you know, work with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. There's another question from Mr. Mohammed Kamrul Hassan. What kind of civil service would you like to see in future in order to make successful graduation? So this question is to the Honorable Senior Secretary. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, there are different uh, branches of the civil service uh, having uh, uh, different kinds of uh, responsibilities. Uh, we in the foreign service, of course, uh, would like to uh, attract uh, more competent and uh, more uh, patriotic, uh, more uh, committed uh, young uh, officers uh, through the Bangladesh civil service uh, exams. 
so that uh, they can uh, they can really uh, work uh, as uh, uh, in the forefront of our uh, of our uh, you know uh, fight uh, to uh, strive uh, forward. Uh, many people say that uh, foreign service is the first line of defense. So uh, whether to protect our interest, whether to promote our interest, nurture our interest in uh, bilateral uh, setting, in multilateral setting, uh, if we have a good bunch of uh, young officers, competent officers, committed officers, then uh, uh, we can make better deals, whether it is the preferential trading agreement that we are talking about, whether uh, we are talking about uh, uh, venturing into new uh, markets, uh, new destinations uh, with new products, or uh, in multilateral settings, uh, you know, during our negotiations with the uh, EU in Brussels or uh, in Geneva, in WTO, in, with WHO, and other organizations, and also in New York uh, on many uh, political issues. Uh, we all know that how the Rohingya uh, uh, crisis is, uh, uh, you know, uh, is. Uh, putting us in a lot of uh, stress, uh, not only environmentally, but also economically and socially. So uh, on all these uh, fronts, and also uh, to harness uh, some of the uh, you know, potentials like the blue economy, like the connectivity that I mentioned. So for that, uh, we need also negotiations, uh, not only uh, multilateral, but also regional in the regional setting. Uh, for example, if we want to uh, do uh, something with Nepal, we have to involve India. And same is uh, Bhutan. So, uh, you know, in the Bay of Bengal region, we see a lot of interest of uh, uh, important countries like the USA, China, Australia, Japan. Uh, therefore, uh, you know, to uh, correctly uh, navigate uh, uh, these interests uh, to our advantage, we have to be constantly engaged uh, with uh, all these factors. And at the end of the day, also, uh, uh, you know, to maintain the contact, to uh, nurture, uh, to work uh, with partnership with our uh, civil society, with our uh, our uh, intellectuals, our academicians, and also our private sector, our business NGOs. Uh, so uh, the new foreign ministry or, uh, or the future foreign ministry uh, will be more engaged with all these uh, uh, sectors that I mentioned. And for that, we need uh, competent people, compassionate people, and also people with open mind to work uh, with everybody uh, in the country and outside the country uh, for the betterment of the country and for the prosperous uh, Bangladesh, for the Sonar Bangla that we all dreamed of. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very encouraging once again. I think, you know, the uh, what I, in my, uh, you know, uh, life so far, uh, my experience is that the young generation today is much more smarter than the young generation what we have seen earlier and uh, not only in bangladesh you know outside bangladesh we see the each and every student wherever they go uh, in the western countries or in east, east asia there are more opportunities nowadays we remember during our time a uh, good textbook uh, we have to sh share we have to go to the library at eight o'clock in the morning and give right. a, uh, have a queue but now they, they in the fingertip, you know, they have all the books <laughs> available. So yeah. opportunities are more also. That's true. That's true. Yeah. And I, I think they are also making many of them are making a good, you know, making the opportunities a good use. But again, having said that, there are also many who don't have that opportunity. And we have to the younger population also people also work towards providing opportunity to each and everyone. That is the you know dream of. Uh, Shonar Bangla, which you have just mentioned. I think we have, we are, you know, we have overshot the time, uh, the allocated uh, time. However, I would give, uh, you know, um, I think one or two minutes to the uh, panelists once again uh, before rounding up, because if the paper presenters, two young uh, ladies presented uh, in the beginning of the session. So if you have any comment to make, uh, you can do so. And then I'll give uh, floor to the senior fellows of YPF to make their concluding remarks and then come back to the Honorable Secretary before rounding up. So Anuradha and Raiza, do you want to say anything? Uh, not so far, Miss. Just really enjoyed the entire dialogue and learned so much researching as well as 
um, listening to the entire dialogue. Yes, um, we have learned so much from all the valuable information and insights everyone here has given to us so far. And thank you so much for giving us the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, so Mr. Rahman, uh, so in two minutes, if you have yeah. any other suggestions. Yeah, no, I think uh, because a very good discussion today, uh, I, I would like to continue to work with the uh, young uh, future policymakers, Anuradha and, 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 and the teammate, if they want my support in developing and research, I'll be there. And I would uh, really uh, want YPF and also uh, our representative from the government here to look into the question that Akhtar Mahmoud Bhai asked. We, had, we talked a lot about API part last 10 years, but when the policies were in place, uh, probably we are not materializing it, taking the full advantage. The question comes whether the fundamentals uh, or the basis of this policy making was right. The same thing needs to be discussed after uh, five or 10 years when the WTO ever goes there, we are talking about fundamental research, API, et cetera. Are we having the focus in the right place or we have to accept some reality and prepare for that? As I was telling, some of the drugs will never be able to uh, uh, manufacture by doing fundamental R&D in Bangladesh. So how do we make sure our people have access to those medicines? If, it, if there is a healthcare disaster, there is pandemic like COVID, of course, there is provision for compulsory licensing. You could manufacture remdesivir anytime you want. But if it is not a pandemic situation, but the disease is really a killer one, and all people should have right to access to those medicines, how do we make sure that they can afford and they can have those medicines? Uh, that is uh, probably a discussion that should go beyond the manufacturers and more towards the policymakers, what sort of economic and financial support policy programs we can have in place. So I would like uh, Dr. Famida, uh, Mr. Momen, young future uh, you know, uh, policymakers to focus on these things at this point. It is the right point to start thinking, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, there's another question from Akhtar Mahmoud Bhai uh, to the Foreign Secretary, Momen. The Foreign Ministry is doing its bit to enhance trade and attract FDI. But trade promotion and especially FDA attraction is a whole of government agenda. Does the Secretary feel that all relevant parts of government are equally committed to the agenda, equally informed about what is needed to attract investment and well coordinated in their work? Uh, if not, will the Foreign Ministry speak out louder for more coordinated actions in the government? <laughs> Thank you for the question. Yes, uh, uh, right now uh, we are uh, pursuing uh, economic diplomacy and uh, uh, economic diplomacy, uh, you know, one of the main uh, major component is, uh, you know, how to attract uh, foreign direct investment. And we have seen uh, some uh, opportunities uh, in recent times uh, due to the disruption of the uh, of the supply chain, especially uh, you know uh, because of the political uh, realignments uh, in the world, uh, you know uh, many countries are moving their uh, investment uh, or factories uh, from uh, example, for example, uh, China or now they will do some uh, also from uh, Myanmar perhaps. And how to uh, utilize uh, these uh, you know opportunities? Uh, we have to be ready. And he correctly uh, said that. Uh, we have to have a whole of the government approach. Uh, you know, it is uh, uh, not uh, foreign ministry or the foreign missions or the our missions uh, abroad, uh, but also uh, there are many uh, domestic uh, stakeholders uh, in Bangladesh, whether it is, uh, uh, you know, law and order or uh, energy uh, uh, sufficiency uh, or uh, the regulatory framework or the NBR or uh, various uh, ministries uh, and the other stakeholders like BIDA or uh, Public pa Private Partnership Authority and our uh, special economic zones, our uh, uh, high-tech uh, uh, parks uh, authority. So there are, uh, uh, you know, multi multiplicity of, uh, of factors and stakeholders. So we have to work uh, together from time to time. Uh, we see it. Uh, uh, now that uh, you know covid had uh, restricted uh, physical uh, movements uh, or physical uh, meetings uh, uh, we are using uh, uh, you know uh, technology uh, and different platforms to connect 
with all these uh, stakeholders, I already mentioned that uh, I connected uh, you know, some of our uh, regional missions uh, with uh, some of the stakeholders uh, like uh, pharmaceutical sector, like uh, agriculture sector, uh, jute sector, uh, then uh, uh, leather sector and uh, ICT sector. So, uh, and also uh, the uh, various government partners. Uh, and in these discussions, uh, uh, you know, there's open and frank, uh, uh, you know, uh, points come out and uh, uh, we, uh, you know, work as a kind of a facilitator uh, so that uh, if, uh, for example, the pharmaceutical uh, industry or uh, uh, leaders have some problem with a particular, uh, you know, ministry or particular, uh, uh, you know, body of the government, then uh, we from the foreign ministry try to also take up uh, the issue uh, for the uh, good uh, of that particular uh, sector. So we are doing it, but perhaps uh, there's always uh, room for uh, improvement. We have a new wing in the ministry called Trade uh, Investment and Technology, TIT. And, and it is their responsibility to uh, conduct uh, these uh, stakeholders uh, meetings uh, uh, to solve some problems, to see new opportunities, and also to uh, you know, uh, engage everybody concerned. Thank you. I think Farmida got dis disconnected. <laughs> so in that case, Samuel have his uh, concluding remarks by the, uh, you know, let me tell. Yes, I'll be very brief uh, given the time. Uh, so it was uh, a fantastic opportunity to hear from all of you and uh, the YTF team. I wanted to thank uh, to them uh, for discussing over, over the days about this uh, subject as well. I think one thing I wanted to highlight in the technology sector that um, if government of Bangladesh uh, can create different type of programs or pilot projects initially while graduating uh, to 2026, when we graduate and see how successful we are, I think that will add a lot of value um, in our program. And if, for, for example, pharmaceutical and government, if they have a hybrid and private um, government relationship or project that can really make a pilot program and incentivized by government and pharmaceutical, then you can really find the solution to some of these problems because uh, it is important that at one point in the future, um, we have to create our own new type of medicines that will solve the problems, new type of technology that will solve our local model issues or create a new local model for the future. So on that basis, I would say that, uh, you know, this is, this is an area where investments are needed and we seriously need to understand how we can uh, interact in this IP intellectual property right domain and increase our skills so it should spread in the academics, the industry, and government, uh, and make sure that we can address these issues. And I think we can. Bangladesh has, has said that can, has adapted to many situations. And as the foreign secretary said, that we are resilient, not only sort of climate change and others, but we have shown that we can do much better. And if you look abroad in many different countries, Bangladeshis have been inventors, Bangladeshis have been great sportsmen, but they got the infrastructure and facilities in those countries. And I think if we can create those snapshots in our country, we can showcase that even being in Bangladesh, we can create those innovations. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I, I think I was disconnected for a while, so I don't know whether uh, Mr. Secretary could uh, complete his response to Akta Mahmoud Fai's question. Okay. Um, so I think uh, I don't see any other question. Uh, and we have, you know, uh, taken 30 minutes extra. I think uh, there has been a lot of interest from the audience. And uh, thank you very much for uh, staying with us uh, and uh, asking questions and making the discussion a lively one. Uh, I think um, I don't need to conclude or you know summarize anything, but in the conclusion, I would say that uh, we have uh, crossed 
one you know milestone but uh, many more are yet to be completed and while we are basking with the pride of uh, you know ldc graduation we also have to remember that we have to do better uh, we are uh, having high growth but high growth doesn't mean anything if it is not distributed equally among the people if majority of the population are left behind and that is also be uh, against the ethos of whole bangladesh's you know um, objective bangladesh's vision uh, bangladesh was born with the vision to have a you know just and uh, just society and inclusive society so i think uh, each and everyone has a role to play in this journey and of course uh, this graduation is an important milestone but that is not the you know end of uh, everything there are many more milestones as i have mentioned and uh, while we will be working towards that we will also have to work uh, for a society which is inclusive and which is also uh, compliant in many uh, aspects in the sense that we have good governance in place and that is also very crucial for uh, a sustainable and smooth graduation in fact in, uh, if you look at the ldc graduation criteria three criteria the per capita GN, gni uh, the human asset index and the economic vulnerability index these are very important index but again without good governance without uh, strong institutions we will not be able to sustain these so in order to have a sustainable uh, graduation and also move beyond uh, that moving forward we have a number of goal posts um, in the horizon by 2031 we will be upper middle income country we want to be and by 2041 we want to be an advanced country so in order to achieve those we have to you know uh, really work hard and um, you know cross the bridges as it comes and i think the young population which are our hope they are into you know they have i see you know, and i feel very encouraged that they have a lot of interest uh, on the development issues of bangladesh this is uh, something unique and this initiative has been really um, you know one of the novel initiatives um, and which is an, also an example for other young people in the country i think with these uh, words uh, i must thank uh, the honorable for secretary for his valuable time the uh, fellows who have joined and made uh, comments and also of course the young two young presenters um, for their excellent presentation we look forward to meet again and also the audience who have been with us for the last uh, two hours and uh, those who have made comments and those who have heard us uh, thank you very much for being with us have a good evening. Thank you, everybody.